In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So I gave you, um, we're going to talk about the noose today, and if you would like a book length treatment of this topic, the best thing out, the best thing available is called The Mind of the Orthodox Church by Metropolitan Herothios Vlakos. Um, I read it three times, literally, the whole thing, three times. Uh, and I think I kind of get it. Uh, and that's the best thing out there. I, there's, there's other stuff that's even more hard to understand. Um, so if we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about um, this word that is translated in the Philokalia, intellect, but is the Greek word nous that roughly translates, like in the King James Bible, most Bible translations, they'll translate it mind. But it's not what we think when we say mind, right? I have this on my mind, right? So we're going to take a look, and I, I made this diagram. Uh, it's the same diagram I used in my catechism class, so you might have seen it before. Uh, but I keep tweaking it a bit. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at it. So let's all start on the side that has, in the red box says, normal, healthy human mind. And uh, if you'll notice, um, there is a large yellow box, the exterior. And that represents the spiritual reality behind the physical world. That's what it says on the top anyway. And then on the bottom, I know it's hard to read white on yellow. And on the bottom, it says that this spiritual reality is perceived noetically. All right, that's the adjective form of noose, right? Noetically, and is accessed through the heart. In other words, we can't get at the spiritual reality that's there through material things, right? The whole material reality, time and space and materiality, is a kind of bubble inside eternity. So that's what the dark box represents. The dark box represents the physical world, which actually also includes our physical bodies, and that's subject to death because of sin, right? So we can't get to God. To, we, we, we can get some hints by meditating on the physical world, especially that there is God. This is something the fathers say often, and even St. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1. Through the physical world, we can come to perceive that there's a God, and I'm not that God, and I need that God deserves my worship. But how do I know that God? How do I get to know that God? Through my heart. That's the yellow dot in the middle, right? And that dot is where God is, and it's also where my true self is. It's where I really am. Most of my self-image that I have, most of what I think about myself, is often what uh, my spiritual father likes to call persona. It's this image of myself, who I wish I were, who I think I should be, who I, uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, image of myself I have in my mind. All right, and then the circles represent the human soul. That is, the immaterial part of the human being. Okay, that soul refers to the immaterial part of the human being. The most outer part of the soul is the sensing part. So basically, my five physical senses. But it's more than that because it involves, um, like, 
you know, I don't feel today good today. I feel grumpy, I, right? Moods, all sorts of things that are in that outer realm of my mind that's most easily influenced by the spiritual or by the physical reality, right? Hi, come in. Grab a, a flyer. Now, notice the blue box on the right. When the fathers of the church, and when any Orthodox spiritual writer is talking about the noose or the mind, they can refer to all three of these levels together, or it can also be referring to the innermost orange level closest to the heart, okay? And what would normally happen, look on the left side, see where our emotions and feelings are? What would normally happen in a sort of heavenly, healthy human mind is we would have feelings and thoughts based on what we encounter, but just because I want ice cream doesn't mean I would control myself, right? And my feelings would turn to prayer. That is, from my, uh, uh, I, would, I would sense, oh, I'm hungry. My mind, that next level, the thoughts would say, hmm, ice cream would be good right now, right? Level of the thoughts, ice cream would be good right now. But then in a healthy human mind, it would continue and turn to God, to that innermost part of my mind, the part that is noetic, that is not conceptual. Sometimes the fathers call it the eyes of the heart. It's not like the heart is seeing, but it's how I see the heart, right? that part of me that can actually perceive spiritual reality. It's not conceptual. It's not verbal. So anytime you would hear someone say, the Lord told me, and then they give you a series of words, you can be darn sure that God didn't give them the series of words. Now, God may have spoken to them in some way, but it's, he's, it's, it, our perception of spirituality is of spiritual reality isn't verbal, right? The, as they say, the language of heaven is silence. Now, once I perceive this, my mind, that rational part of my mind, that conceptual, verbal, imaginative part of my mind might turn it into pictures or words, trying to express the thing that I'm perceiving at a deeper level. But as many of the fathers of the church have said, to speak of God is to lie. As soon as you conceptualize, as soon as you start to put it in words, you've changed. It's not really what it was at that deeper level, right? We still speak because it's what we have. That's the problem. That's why I put at the bottom the warning. See the warning at the bottom? Warning, this is not what the soul looks like. It's a learning aid and should be discarded as soon as possible, right? It's just an aid, right? Because as soon as I try to make a map, as soon as I'm, I'm perverting it terribly. It's not what it really is. But nonetheless, symbols, signs, words, language help point us in a direction, all right? So asceticism and prayer brings the mind into the heart. I encounter stuff. Uh, I turn it into prayer. And then from my heart comes illumination, understanding, right? And virtue manifesting the life of Christ. Now let's flip it and take a look at the other side. This is what I like to call the 
feedback loop of the passions. It's what a fallen, broken human experience looks like. Uh, so, basically, my mind and my emotions dominate everything. Feelings, things I encounter, my tummy says, hmm, I'm hungry, right? My mind says ice cream would be good. And it feeds right back to my tummy and says, my tummy says, yeah, ice cream is just what I need. And my mind says, see, I told you, we really need ice cream. And it's this feedback loop that causes passion. Right? Uh, before I know it, ice cream becomes something much more to me than just frozen cow's milk with sugar, right? I have this whole image of that thing, right? I have to have it. It means something to me. I won't be happy if I don't get it, right? I lose my sense of peace. I lose my equilibrium. I've got to have this stuff. I've got to have it, like an addiction, right? But the thing I'm addicted to isn't just the ice cream. It's the image of the ice cream I've got stuck in my head, right? I associate it with happy feelings. I associate it with uh, relief from anxiety. I associate it with all sorts of things. Fears, ad addictions, lusts, angers, right? Have you ever gotten really angry at somebody and it wasn't, you haven't even had a conversation with them. I'm reading this um, uh, Italian novel, a 19th century Italian novel. It's really good, very Dickens-esque. Um, but I can't remember, I think it's called the, uh, the Betrothed. That's the title of it. Uh, and he, in it, he has this great line, human beings have this amazing ability to hate one another even if they've never met, right? It's just like we can hate people we've never even met. Why? Because we have an image in our mind and that image we're projecting out and that's what's motivating faith. We can lust for things or people or whatever experiences that we've never encountered before. Why? Because it's an image in our mind. All right, which takes us, so there's something to look at. Notice if you've seen the old one, I've made the edges fuzzy to kind of emphasize of the circles that these aren't clear lines. But anyway, so that's there. Let's um, spend just a couple of, uh, about five or seven minutes just on these next ones here. So we had finished with, we were talking about six. What happens when the intellect, which is the noose, right? Which can refer to all of our mind or most specifically that part of our mind that relates to God. Like in lots of words, sometimes a word has a bigger meaning and a narrow meaning at the same time. Right? So the bigger meaning can be mind in general, but the narrow meaning, how it's most often used in spiritual writing, is it's referring to that part of our mind, non-conceptual, non-verbal, that relates to God. It says, when the noose is concentrated on the love of God, you pay little attention to visible things and will regard even your body as something alien. So we read about the martyr Varus tonight in, in Vespers, right? As he's being terribly tortured, he says, and he experienced it as though it were not his own body. Why? Because he, his mind was turned, his attention was towards God, and in, and in that state, he didn't even notice. And you know, this isn't as spooky as it seems. How many of you have had the experience when you're caught up in a certain task and you're all in, you're absorbed and time just goes by? Or have you had the experience when 
like uh, I used to work on cars, right? And thank God, not anymore. But uh, it was something I really enjoyed at a season of my life. And, uh, you know, metal and flesh don't mix well. And so anyone who works on cars bleeds. It's just the way it goes, right? And, uh, you know, I could be caught up into rebuilding this engine, working on this thing, and bang and be dripping with blood and on my knuckles and, uh, and then suddenly go, oh, what time is it? And it's like, oh my goodness, I've been doing this four hours, five hours. I didn't even, didn't even, the time went by and oh my gosh, my knuckles are killing me and, and I gotta go to the bathroom. And <laughs> you know, it's like, I was as though I wasn't in my body. I don't know if you've ever had experiences like that, where you're just so focused on something, right? But it most particularly happens in what St. Maximus is talking about, that we can have that kind of focus on God in prayer, where we're just caught up and we're, just, we're with him in prayer. This word concentrated, I think... Um, we have to, Maximus equates love. Love is the same as valuing, right? When we love God, we value the knowledge of God. And then here he connects a value with concentrating or paying attention. That for Maximus, there's this clear link between love and pay attention. You pay attention to what you love. And when in our heart, our attention is directed, or in our heart, see, in English we use the heart just as a general word for our inner reality, right? Whereas in the literature it often has a more technical meaning. But so in our inner reality, when our attention is towards God, then yes, we still might... Um, you know, have to react and interact with various things. But our attention, everything that comes to us, is referenced to our relationship with God. And through that comes illumination, right? Illumination about what's going on, what reality is, what's really happening in me, what's really happening around me, right? Uh, how to really understand things. And then virtue, how to really resp how to respond to things. And so it results in this life of Christ. But when our attention is set towards physical things, particularly our body and what, we've, what we imagine in our mind will make our body happy or make us important or make us famous, whatever the idol in our brain is or idols of our brain are, right? Our tension is focused there, we end up in the passion feedback loop, right? And it's as though we're completely ignoring God. And so because we're beginners, <laughs> you know, uh, we may only have brief moments when our attention is really directed to God. Right? Uh, someone once asked me the question, why do we go to church for two hours if I only really end up praying about five minutes in those two hours? And uh, someone who was with me answered very wisely and said, sometimes it takes two hours to pray five minutes. It just, you, just to get there, just to let go of all your thoughts and your distractions and and just turn, try to turn inward, turn into your heart, and, and pay attention and pray. Okay, last one. This is a good, good one, too. Seven. Since the soul is more noble than the body, and God incomparably more noble than the soul, noble than the world created by him, he who values, so there that value, love, value, pay attention to, he who values the body more than the soul and the world created by God 
more than the creator, so if you battle, value the body more than the soul, and you value the world more than the one who created it, is simply a worshiper of idols. What's the idol? The idol is the image in your mind. That's the idol. The thing that you're paying attention to in your mind, right? I'm not important, nobody loves me. Oh, look, at, look at me, oh, poor me, right? It's an idol, it's an image, right? I'm great, I'm wonderful, everyone else is an idiot. It's an idol, it's an idol, right? We won't mention any names, any political leaders who that might apply <laughs> particularly to. Um, but, you know, or where can I get the next fix? Where can I get the next bowl of ice cream? Where can I get the next whatever it is? It's an idol. And if, and you're simply, Maximus says, you're simply a worshiper of idols because you've turned your attention away from God, right? To this thing in your head. All right. Uh, we can talk some more, um, and uh, you know, if you want to ask questions, you can always ask questions. Um, but I want to let the ladies go. I got some questions for the ladies to discuss. I just got distracted because my gutters got backed up, and I was out cleaning out my gutters, so I didn't get uh, the wind. So anyway, so God bless you, and uh, have a wonderful ladies' meeting.